to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. Tonight we'll be starting a brand new series looking at and taking an in-depth look at what is the most radical, the most relevant, the most powerful and life-changing sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. I'm here tonight with my dear brother and Lord Mark and my lovely wife Alice. Hello everybody. You got to say hello back, okay. <laughs> So before we start, I'd like to uh, I'd like to ask the Lord's help <laughs> for me. So Father, I do. I just come to you in the name of your Son Christ Jesus, and I pray, Lord God, that you would put a watch over my mouth, that I wouldn't speak anything, Lord, that you would not have me speak, and Lord, that you would open all of our ears, that you would dig out our ears, that we might hear your voice, for it's your voice, Lord God, that creates faith in our lives, faith that gives us the power to live a life in imitation of your Son, Christ Jesus. Just bless our time gathered in your word. I ask that, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, as I said, we're going to start a new Bible study in the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, I, I want to start with an introduction tonight. And in that introduction, I want, to, I want to share this with you, because what struck me as I started praying about this was that I was on a search for relevance. Now, the word relevant means, and this is from the dictionary, okay? It, it's bearing upon or connected with the matter in hand. It's pertinent, right? It has direct bearing on the matter in hand, right? So... Got that? I mean, I think everybody has an idea of what relevant means. But here's something interesting. It comes from the Latin word, relevare, which means to raise or lift up. And I think you'll see the significance of that as we, as we get into this and go along, all right? A number of years ago, Alice and I had returned to, from one of our trips, our mission trips, to, uh, we were in France. And when we came back, at one of the Bible studies, I was commenting on the fact that I saw France as an incredibly spiritually dry place, so dry that a little spark could start a great big fire. I have faith in that. But the thing that struck me about France and, and much of Europe that we've seen in our travels is the attitude that they, most people have towards Christianity. It's not antagonistic. It's not that they hate Christianity. It's not that they want to persecute Christianity. It's just that they ignore Christianity. And when I came back from France, I said, what I saw was the fact that Christianity was totally irrelevant. It just didn't matter. It wasn't something that was in people's hearts and their minds and their mouth. It just, you know, they went about their daily life with ever, without, without ever thinking about Jesus Christ or Christianity. Because it had become irrelevant. It had no connection to their daily lives. And I think what we're going to see, and what, what I found to be important, is that what the Sermon on the Mount is, is it's relevant. It is that connection between the Word of God and our daily lives, particularly in these troubled times. So that's what we're going to look at. The other thing, as I was praying about this, something struck me. I went and I saw there's a major Christian research group. And every year they do a survey, an end-of-the-year survey, to talk about the trends that they saw in Christianity here in the United States during the past year. And I'd like to read you some of the quotes from the most current study, right? a survey of trends from last year, 2011. These are quotes. Almost half of all Americans said it doesn't matter what religious faith you follow, because they all teach the same lessons. Half of Americans believe that all people are eventually saved or accepted by God, no matter what they do. A large number of young people stated the church is boring. Amen. I agree. Okay. The Bible is not taught clearly or often enough. And that's true. That's true. But here was the thing that struck me. They said, faith is not relevant to my career or interests. And then a consistent theme from the research this year is Americans' growing acceptance of limitations. A redefined American dream that includes lowered expectations 
rethinking spending habits and, and relearning savings. Everything's going down. But remember, interestingly enough, and I don't think people think of this when you talk about relevance, relevance has to do with lifting up and raising up. All right? But the world is going down. Expectations are going down. That's because expectations are based on what the world is saying and what the world is doing. Where the calling of God in our lives is an upward calling. All right. Three out of ten adults have reduced their giving to churches, and four out of ten have downgraded their giving to nonprofits. Only one sixth, one sixth of Christians say that they are totally committed to engaging in personal spiritual development. In other words, spiritual development is irrelevant. They're not, they're, that was one sixth of Christians, not one sixth of just people. That's right. One sixth of Christians, people that. People that proclaim themselves Christians, only one-sixth of them have any interest in their spiritual development. Are serious about yeah. it. And among those who believe that they are Christians, only one-fifth say that they live in a way that makes them completely dependent on God. Only one-fifth. That means four-fifths of those people who call themselves Christians in this country are dependent on God. Now, let me just... What they're saying is that Christianity is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So what I saw in France is also true. It was true in the United Kingdom where we spent a lot of time. It's true throughout the United States. Mm -hmm. that the issue that we're dealing with today is that it's, it's not you know, people being against Christianity for it. It's just irrelevant. It's not, they don't think about it. it doesn't take, they may think about it on Sundays when they pack up to go to a church building. But they don't think about it Wednesdays at 10 o'clock while they're at work. Or Saturday night while they're out partying. It has no place in their, in their lives. Now, this starts at an early age. One of the major concerns I have with the educational system in the United States, as well as the UK, by the way, that in practical terms, young people are being taught by what they are not being taught, that Jesus Christ is irrelevant. He's made unimportant by his absence. If you send your kids to school and they learn that, that the school is telling them we're going we're gonna to train you for life, and they teach them language skills and mathematics skills, but don't, talk, don't bring Christ into the equation, they have taught that Christ is unimportant to the, your life. Yeah, he doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. Yeah. In other words, he's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Now, Christian parents send their children off to government-run schools to be taught not just the language skills but a lifestyle or better put a style of life right every day those same Christian parents then march off to the workplace where they very loudly proclaim by their actions that once again Jesus Christ is unnecessary and unneeded think about that now, and I pray that you've, you've been here enough. If you don't listen, maybe this is your first time here. I don't say these things in condemnation. But, you know, we're studying the Word of God, and Paul wrote to Timothy and said, All Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness. We need the Word of God to stir us up to be where we're supposed to be. The church isn't doing a great job at this, or much of the church is, and I'll say that. Because we were just talking about this before we started tonight. There are so many churches today that have come to a place where they are no longer talking about sin. And some of the mega churches, the major churches, the churches that are impacting the church around the world, have said, the, the heads of these churches have come right out and said, you know, I, I mentioned, I, I will, Schuler, for example, at, at Crystal Cathedral, which is now in trouble. But he talked about the fact he didn't want to talk about sin because that turns people off. I doubt very seriously you're going to hear Joel Osteen talk about sin. I went to another mega church and, and he doesn't say that particularly, but he said he won't talk about abortion, he won't talk about homosexuality, he won't talk about so many sins because that turns people off. Well, the fact of the matter is, if you don't preach sin, which by the way, Jesus Christ did over and over and over and over, so did like the Apostle Paul saying, all men are sinners and fall short of the glory, you know, the, the grace of God here. Fall short of what his expectations are in our life. Praise God, we know fall short of his grace. 
But if you don't preach sin, then you have made Christ on the cross irrelevant, unnecessary. He came to forgive sin, to die as an atonement for sin. If there's no sin, we don't need Christ on the cross. So, you know, that scares me. It scares me to see a church that has done that because the, the cross has become unimportant to their Christianity where the cross was all that Paul knew as his Christianity. He said, I've determined to know nothing but Christ and Him crucified. You know, a number of years ago, uh, B.J. Thomas sang a wonderful song that was written by Archie Jordan. And what a difference you've made in my life. I, I don't know if you're familiar with that song. It's really a pretty song. Now, receiving the gift of new life in Christ Jesus should result in a new lifestyle. Or that style, that, that style of life, should cause us to be able to say like Paul, but thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ Jesus and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. So we are bringing the knowledge. That's our job as Christians is to bring this fragrant aroma, this knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus in every place, both to the saved and the unsaved. But being relevant doesn't mean being like the world. Correct. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because you don't have to act like the world, you don't have to look like the world. No. You know, We're not to imitate the world. But Paul said that, uh, you know, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, which is good and acceptable and perfect. Romans 12, verse 2. Because I've seen this going on in the church today, that a lot of guys are out there, or, you know, a lot of people are out there preaching, and in order for them to think that they're being relevant, they're imitating the world. That's the last thing in the world we should do. Because that's them coming down, rather than allowing God to lift people up. Relevant means lifting up. You don't have to have tattoos or piercings to reach the world for Christ. Now listen, if you have tattoos or piercings, I'm not saying that you condemn, but I'm saying you don't have to have that to be able to minister to the people that do have tattoos and piercings. Jesus Christ never had a sin, but he ministered to the sinners. The marks that Christ bore and his pierced hands that are always reaching out to the world teach us the way to be relevant, bringing the love of God and the light of his word into every place mm -hmm. to raise and to lift up, right? Relevere, mm -hmm. to lift up. The church needs to become relevant. We need to bring this love. And you're not going to find the expression of God's love other than the cross, but in a sermon, as much as you're going to see it here in the Sermon on the Mount. The other thing was, I mean, this, this concept or, of the church being relevant, making or encouraging and equipping people to be, be relevant out in the world is not something that just struck me. Almost, well... 20 years ago, in 1992, mm -hmm. when Alice and I had come back from, from living in Belize in Central America, where Mark was down there with us, I started a ministry called the M.D. Solomon Institute. And the focus of that was to bring biblical principles into the workplace, right? To help, to equip and encourage Christians to live the Word of God out in their daily lives. And, and I just want to read you this. This is on the front page of our website for the M.D. Solomon Company, which is mdsolomon.com, right? But I'll, I'll read what it says on the front page. The M.D. Solomon Institute was founded in 1992 with a vision that the Lord gave us to equip and encourage Christians to live a holy, that's W-H-O, holy, complete, to live a holy and holy, H-O-L-Y, integrated life. A life in which a person's business life 
was not separated from his or her spiritual life, family life from workplace life, and church life from daily life. Our goal was to teach best practices in all walks of life as defined by scripture to achieve excellence in all walks of life. It is about taking the faith that Christ has given us that comes from hearing his word and then living it day by day, making it relevant that it pertains to our daily life. It's not just about what happens on Sunday in the confines of your little church building. Now, this M.D. Solomon Company was actually born out of my experience almost 15 years earlier than that when I was the national sales manager of a communications company in New York. I was also the pastor of a church in the suburbs of New York at the same time. I had seen what happens when you live an integrated life. I had seen what happens when you take the Word of God and apply it, proclaim it, and live it Monday through Friday mm -hmm. out in the workplace. The Lord blessed me both in the spirit and the natural realm along with everybody around me. Now, I just wanted to read this, these scriptures to you. All right? This is from Deuteronomy chapter 28. And by the way, throughout this study, not just tonight, but I mean particularly when we, you know, as we get into the Sermon on the Mount, it would be great for you to be prepared to take some notes, you know, jot down things, because I want you to test what I say against the Word of God. All right? Don't take my word for stuff. Test it. And by the way, you can always write to us. If you have questions, if you have comments about what we're doing here, please just you know get on your little emaily thing and write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. We'd love to hear from you. Right? Deuteronomy 28. Now it shall be if you diligently if 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 you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all His commandments which I command you today. The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the offspring of your body and the produce of your ground, the offspring of your beasts, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord shall cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you. They will come out against you one way, and they will flee before you seven ways. I'll stop there, because hopefully, I mean, you get the idea. And if this isn't relevant to life today, when people are, are moving hither and thither and yon to try and find blessings, to find work, to find, you know, we're living in a time of economic crisis, not just here in the United States, but worldwide. And here is the Lord's promise that if you apply His, if you're obedient to His Word, if you apply His Word in your daily life, all these blessings are going to come upon you. He's going to bless your spouse, He'll bless your kids, He'll bless your kitty cats and puppy dogs. He'll bless your work. He'll bless your finances, no matter where you are, and he will defeat your enemies. Now, if you don't believe this word of God, if you don't believe that he indeed watches over his word to perform it, well, then I, then I hope that through this Bible study you'll be encouraged to, to do that, that faith will rise up in you to do that. Or otherwise, you know what? Why don't you turn off the internet, May God forgive me. Go down to the bar and get good and souse. Get drunk. Because you don't want to see what's happening. This world that we live in is an absolute disaster and getting worse by the day. And the only hope, not one of the hopes, not one of the many religions that this is the hope that we have that is an anchor of our soul is the Word of God. You said that there was a commercial that's running now. I think it's the Verizon kind of portrays that? Um, I, yeah, no, it wasn't Verizon, I think. It, well, it may have been from Verizon, yeah. And as a matter of fact, Bob Rizzoni and I were talking about this the other day on the phone. Uh, it, you, you may have seen it. Mm. It's a picture of a young guy, and as the commercial starts out, he's putting earbuds in his ears and listening to music on his cell phone. And as he's walking along, there's, 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 they're, they're playing, there's disaster 
all around him. I mean, there's all kinds of disaster. Buildings are falling down, cars are crashing. And he's going along, and it's just, and he's totally oblivious to it. Well, that, I don't know what that does for their sales of some phones, but that <laughs> certainly should touch the hearts of believers, because it is an incredibly accurate picture of the culture and society that we live in, that people have become oblivious to the truth of what is going on around them as they are distracted by their entertainment and little, and little side things that they have chosen to do. These are desperately, desperately, desperately perilous times. Like none it's, other. And it's like, you know, experience. It kind of reminds me of the, what you said in France at one time. Um, why don't people help us more? Yeah, because they don't care. They don't care. The thing is, you know, my favorite movie, uh, I, I distract myself. My favorite movie of all time, without doubt, is Ben-Hur, uh, with Charlton Heston, right? Judah Ben-Hur, which, by the way, was written by, Sir, uh, by General Lou Wallace. And the name, the actual name of the movie and the actual name of the book was uh, Judah Ben-Hur, A Story of the Christ. It's not, the story is not about Ben-Hur. The story is about Jesus Christ. And it was that movie that I saw in its, in its opening debut in New York City as a young man. When I say young, I was probably 13 years old. Struck and grabbed my heart because it's a wonderful portrayal of Jesus Christ. It absolutely is. It won more Oscars and more accolades. This is part of the difference. I, get, I remember when this was released. If I took a guess, that would put it somewhere around 1956 or 57. But to show you the difference in times, all right? That won the most Academy Awards of any movie ever up until that time. When a list of the top 100 movies of all time was done a, a number of years later, Ben-Hur wasn't even on the list. Didn't make the list. No. That's an attitude towards Jesus Christ. That's not an attitude towards entertainment or movies. He wasn't really but, but then, so it was replaced, by the way, as the top um, Academy Award winning movie of all time. By another movie, Titanic. Titanic. Now, if you did, if you did not see and pay attention to Ben Hur, I strongly suggest that you pay attention to the movie Titanic, because brother, this ship we call Earth is going down. It may not be instantly, but I'll tell you what—we struck that iceberg a long time ago. It's sinking. And it's sinking. And you want to know something? There, there weren't enough lifeboats to rescue all of the people on the Titanic. But I'm here tonight to tell you that there is a lifeboat that you can jump into and be rescued safe and sound from all alarm and harm. And his name is Jesus Christ. That's, right. that's not has, relevant to you with a ship going down. Unlimited seating capacity. Un unlimited capacity. That's right. All right? So. God wants to bless you. It is his desire. He has made a plan to bless you. A lot of people see, and this is their perception of the church, and one of the reasons that it's become irrelevant, is they see it as a place of rules and regulations and putting people down. Jesus Christ said, and I, I just want to tell you that the day that I got saved, sitting at my kitchen table, and I opened the Bible for the first time in my life, and looked down and I saw these words, Jesus said, I came that you might have joy, and that your joy would be made full. I came that you would have life. I came that you have life and have it abundantly. Christ's desire for your life is blessing. Now, if the church has failed to proclaim that accurately, shame on the church. But I'm here tonight to tell you that God's desire is to give you a joy-filled life that is independent of the worldly circumstances. I think people's concept of church today, when they hear church, it's always about money. That's, whenever well, you talk to somebody and you talk about church, the church, on the, to that's, all they, do. that's well, all they do. That's all they do. Yes. Or it's, it's about money and it's about buildings. Yeah. Which, by the Building way, funds. Uh, right, it's, are, are closely associated. Yes. It is about the cross of Jesus Christ. It is about being restored to a right relationship with God the Father through the work of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Okay? And, and that is. But what we're talking about now is, you see, that is a free gift. You don't have to do anything to have that right relationship, to have that one life, other than to receive yes. it, accept it, say yes. That's all it takes. 
You don't have to go spend hours at the church. You don't have to go to a confessional box. You don't have to go. All you have to do is recognize your need and turn to the one who can care for that need. His name is Jesus Christ. All right? When we get into the Sermon on the Mount, now we're saying what he's talking to, because you'll see, he's talking to those who have received him, <clears throat> to those who have accepted him. The Sermon on the Mount was not a sermon that is pitched out to the unbelievers. Right? It is a sermon to believers on how that new style of life, that, that, that is, that new life, should be lived. Plan. It's a plan. For what? It's a plan for your blessing. Yes. Yes. Okay. No, I, I just, I may digress here, but when you said yes, what I just came into my mind was Yeshua, eternal salvation. That's what it is. Yeah. Okay. Hallelujah. Okay. The Word of God, and that's what we're here to study, okay, the Word of God, His divine power, is not about church. It's about everything pertaining to to life and godliness. Mm -hmm. The Word of God is about your job. The Word of God, husband, is about your relationship with your wife. Wife, your relationship with your husband. The Word of God, parents, is about your relationship with your children. Mm -hmm. The Word of God is about your job. It's about your finances. It's, it's, about, about, your family. it's about your family. That's what the Word of God is about. Mm -hmm. It's not about you know how you behave on Sundays inside that little white building on the corner. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, by the way, that, that verse, okay, that God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness is in 2 Peter 1.3. That sounds like the Lord lifting you up, lifting me up, lifting us up, mm -hmm. out of the pit, out of the miry clay of this world. Now that sounds pretty relevant to me. I mean, we're living in a world that is so down. I would think that you would be concerned about finding a way to get lifted up. Love lifted me. The problem has been that over the centuries, the church has separated itself from the world in a way that Jesus never intended. Now listen to these two verses, okay? From John 17, 11, Jesus said, when he was praying in the garden, he said, I am, and he's talking to the Father, I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves, talking about us, they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be even may, they may be one, even as we are one. And then in verse 16 he goes on to say, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So the purpose of this study is to help us make to help make us more like Jesus while we are in, but not of the world. Okay? And unity. Absolutely. That's absolutely. Okay. So what I'm doing in this introduction is I just want to set the stage for this. Because the Bible is not just a whole bunch of, you know, separated verses. It is a history of mankind and God's action with mankind, right? There's a context to the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. Now remember, this is fairly early in the life or the ministry of Jesus Christ that the Sermon on the Mount takes place. So I just want to set the stage as we before we get into this study. So you get a get a little bit of a picture. So let me go back to the early years of Jesus Christ. At birth, Jesus was miraculously born into the earth in the fullness of time. That's what it says in Galatians 4 4. And in his gospel, Matthew goes on to great lengths to ensure that we know that his coming was according to the scriptures. Right? Matthew 1. It's really important that we understand that Christ's birth is the fulfillment of prophecy according to the scripture. Now, let me give you a little relevance alert here. When you talk about the birth of Jesus Christ, one of the gigantic issues that consumes our world, not just our country, our state, our country today, is taxes. Right? Okay. I want to give you a little relevance Relevance. Mm -hmm. Alert. The birth of Jesus Christ has a lot to do with taxes. taxes right. Because it was the institution of certain tax policies. Remember, Caesar Augustus made a declaration 
that everybody had to go to take part in a census. And the, the purpose of that was so that they would have accurate collection of taxes. So Mary and Joseph, who lived in Nazareth, were required to go to the home of Joseph, the city of David, Bethlehem, pack up and go. This is a businessman, by the way. He's a carpenter. He's got a carpentry shop. He has a business. But all of a sudden, the Romans declare that he has to get up, cart his pregnant wife all the way down to Bethlehem so that they make sure that they get the right taxes from him. My point is, if you understand the Word of God, when you're faced with the world that we have today, and the issue is taxes, taxes, and it's always about taxes, you know what? America wouldn't be the United States of America had it not been for taxes that some people didn't like, so they rebelled against King George because they didn't want to pay taxes. You ever hear of the Tea Party? Oh, not the one today. I'm talking about the Tea Party in Boston, Boston Harbor. It was a revolt against taxes. But here the Word of God is revealing something to us. And that is, regardless of how onerous the taxes are or the situation is, God will turn it and use it to His purpose. Which is exactly what we studied as we ended up in our last study in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. About rejoicing always, about giving thanks in all things. So, listen, as you face all of these trials and tribulations, then you need to know that God has a plan and God is in control. Yes. And regardless of how bad things look in your life, God can turn it and use it for good. Amen. <laughs> okay. By the way, the kings that man has chosen in place of God, they, they never change. Oh, yeah, I mean, there may be a new name on the door, same old, same old. but it's the same old, same old. You see, they're under a curse. curse to repeat. No matter who winds up, listen, you, you are called, you and I are called to appraise all things spiritually. The fact of the matter is, God spoke to Samuel. Listen to this. This is from 1 Samuel 8, verses 10 and 11. So Samuel spoke all the words of the Lord to the people who had asked of him a king. He said, this will be the procedure of the king who will reign over you. God said to Samuel, you know, listen, Samuel, they haven't rejected you. They have rejected me as being king over them. This is the people of God who just wanted to be like the other nations. And be like the world. If he said, Samuel, God spoke to Samuel and said, here's the way it's going to be. Because here's the way the kings are in the world. And he goes on to list the horror. And one of the parts, he's going to take your sons and your daughters. He's going to take your money. He's going to take all this. He's going to take, take your land. That's the way of the world. Yes. The world is under that curse. Regardless of who gets elected as the next prime minister in the UK, regardless of who gets elected in the, the, as the next president of these United States, you're going to still be under that same curse from God because Jesus Christ is he is the king of kings he is the lord of lords and he is the king of glory but he is not the king over the United States of America because the people have said give us a king that we might be like the nations deal with it okay now as a child that's at his birth as a child Luke in his synoptic you know what synoptic means the, the, the three of the Gospels are what's called synoptic. There, there are synoptic books in the Bible. In other words, they're basically they're, they're, they're re oh, recounting yeah. the same events. But in different perspectives. But slightly different perspective, all right? So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all telling the same, basically the same, uh, they're giving accounts of the same events, right. but from a slightly different perspective. So in Luke in his Gospel tells us that when Jesus Christ was 12 years old, the teachers in the temple... And this is a quote. And all those who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. That's Luke 2, 47. That's when Jesus stayed behind when his parents went off. And he's there in the temple. And he is with the teachers of the word of God. And he's understanding everything they're saying. And he's asking questions and he's saying things. And they are amazed at 12 years old. Now, let me give you another, give you another relevance alert. Because if you don't think this is important... One of the single biggest problems of the day is the disorientation and poor behavior of our young people. 
Now, listen, there's always been a problem with young people. Because it says in the Bible that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Okay? I, I was looking at I mean, Seneca, uh, Seneca the Younger, who was a Roman philosopher back in the time of Christ. You know, he talked about how the youth are always troublesome. But it's a matter of degree. We just passed New Year's Eve here, it's, uh, and I was reading an article in the news, I follow a lot of news in England because we do a lot of ministry there. And it was horrible to see young people just literally scattered all over the streets, passed out drunk in the streets, all, because drinking is an incredible problem with young people in England. Teenage pregnancy in England is mind-boggling, the scope of it. It's bad enough here in the United States, but it's far worse in the United Kingdom. The, you know, I, I don't say this in condemnation. I, I'm telling you, these kids are disoriented. Yes. They're disoriented because, why? Well, because we didn't understand the relevance of the Word of God. Jesus chose to be in the temple. There were a lot of kids in Jerusalem at the time of this event. But Jesus, where were they? Maybe they were out playing stickball in the street. I can, I can relate to that. Where was Jesus? He was in the temple soaking up the word. Okay? Now Jesus and Mary, I mean Jesus, excuse me, Joseph and Mary, it is evident in Scripture, were obedient to the word of God. Faithful, filled with faith, filled with the favor of God. So they... I am convinced they would have been obedient to the word which says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, 6. They would have trained Jesus in the word. He's not out in the street drinking. He's not out playing stickball. He's not out just doing, you know, irrelevant things. He is in the temple, or surrounded by the word. Now, that's opposed to you train up a child in the way he should go. That's opposed to the Dr. Spock method, which you know, let a kid do whatever he wants, right? Proverbs 29, 15 says this, a child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. This is so true. If this, if this word of God is not relevant to what's going on in the world today, I, I don't get it, right? I, this upsets me. I, I mentioned this a few times in a few other Bible studies. It was I saw an advertisement. I don't even remember what it was now, but it, was, it had something to do with with you know newborn babies, and his parents are talking to say, "Isn't it too bad that children don't come with an instruction book?" Yeah. They do. Well, of course they do. It's called the Bible. Absolutely. Okay. One of the experts ends a discussion. The experts on child rearing ends a discussion with this statement. Of one thing we can be certain, there has never been a child that was brought up right. That's what the child rearing experts have to say. Let me tell you something. I don't know who you are, but I pray to God that somehow this message gets to you. We're just talking about a child who was brought up right. His name was Jesus Christ, the son of Joseph the carpenter. He was brought up right. And your children can be brought up right if indeed you will bring them up in the ways they should go. And the ways they should go are defined by the Word of God. One thing we can actually be certain of, those who reject the Word will never know the truth. That's a, that is the That's truth. All right? all right. So now after this, after his birth, after a young man, we don't have anything for a while. But now we have Jesus as a public person. Now what I mean is, you know, I've seen books on the hidden lives, the hidden years of Jesus Christ. We don't know. We've been given everything pertaining to life of God and godliness. That's not in here. So beware of the people who would tell you about those years of Jesus Christ. That's coming out of their own imagination. God hid them. That's right. All right? So Christ was hidden for a while. But now he becomes a public person. It all starts, everything about the ministry of Jesus Christ starts with an endorsement, both from man and from God the Father. Listen to these verses from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 3.11 As for me, this is John the Baptist speaking, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. 
Then down in verse 13, he says, Then Jesus arrived, arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. A couple of verses later, in 16 and 17, it says, After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So now, Christ is publicly introduced to the world in his ministry. Right? I got another relevant alert for you. What was that? You want to know what that was? You're going to... Like it's coming out for you. Uh, that's the coming out for you. Like bar mitzvah. Right. How about ordination? Ah, yes. It was his ordination. Now, the, the problem is that there are a lot of quote-unquote ordained people, men of the cloth, the right reverend this and the right reverend that, and they've never been ordained by God. Ordination from God is God puts a calling on your life and equips you to fulfill that calling. Men don't ordain people. When the, the process of a... Of a Ordaining a human is a recognition of what God has done in that person's life. We don't, mankind doesn't have the power to impart that power and gifts to somebody, but they have the, the power to recognize, we have the ability to recognize the gifts and the calling of God in another person's life. And that's what we call ordination. That's what this is. This is, the, this is how Jesus is introduced to the world in ministry. He is ordained by God the Father. Yes. All right, from there what happens? You have Jesus in the wilderness. This is preparation, all right? So now, he immediately... By the way, let me just say this about baptism. Baptism is... Baptism doesn't do anything in your life. It doesn't it doesn't cleanse you from sin. Alright? It doesn't make you it doesn't make you part of the church. Okay? The word baptism comes from the Greek to be washed. But it doesn't wash you. Alright? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. We are washed clean by the shed blood of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. Baptism is a public proclamation of what God has done. It says, better is an open rebuke than love unspoken. We are supposed to speak out loud. We're supposed to proclaim our faith. Right? Mm -hmm. Baptism, it's not that it's accomplishing something in you. What it is doing is, it is your proclamation of what God has done. All right? Like the, we, Christ died, was buried, and was raised. That baptism, as you are ducked into the water and raised up, it is symbolic of when you accept Jesus Christ, you have you have died, and then your life is hidden in Christ Jesus. The old self has died, and you come in, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. That new creation rises up from the depths, right? So baptism, what it does is it's not the act that, as so many denominations kind of teach and preach, you know, they can sprinkle a kid and all of a sudden something miraculous has happened. That's not true. Yeah. Something miraculous happens when you say yes to the gift of God, to Jesus Christ on the cross. Mm -hmm. In Acts chapter 16, when Paul and Silas are in Philippi in the jail, and if you don't know the story, go read it in Acts 16. It's a great story. Mm -hmm. And God sets them free by shaking the whole place. The jailer says to Paul, what must I do to be saved? He doesn't say, oh, you better go get baptized, you better go down and tithe, you better go to the church. What he says is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved in your household. But then he takes them and baptizes them. Baptism, as it, baptism follows the saving event. It doesn't create the saving event. The problem is, that can separate it from church. Now, you know, I know this. I know this from experience because I wasn't saved in a church. No. When I say church, I'm using that in the, the, erroneous, the erroneous common way, talking about a building, because no building is the church. I was saved at my kitchen table. 
I sat down and I had an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And that day I got saved because I accepted him as the Lord and Savior of my life. Okay, baptism followed that. But I didn't get saved inside the context of a building called a church. You don't have to be in a church building to get saved. You know, if you're watching this now and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't need to run down to a church building. All you got to do is say right now, turn to the Lord and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I receive that. And hallelujah, then you are the church. Okay. Another living holder. Yeah, because, it, right, the church is built up of living stones. That's, That's us. Stone. Right? That was the word I was talking about. Okay, so now Jesus, he has had that childhood raised in the ways he should go. He has now had this public acclamation of John the Baptist recognized in the land as a prophet foretelling the coming of the Messiah. And he has the, the, the God the Father speaking, you know, that this is his son, right? So what happens immediately? He is attacked. Yes. Many of the afflictions of the righteous, David wrote. But listen, when you get attacked by the devil, just, I, I don't, Matthew 4, 1 says this, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Put in. God leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Jesus Christ was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. You better stop groaning about being attacked and start showing, oh my goodness, now I have an opportunity for victory that will be a living testimony to the power of God and the love of God. Well, if you haven't read that in Matthew chapter 4 about, you know, Jesus being attacked by the devil and how he responded, always by saying, it is written. But at the end of that, it says in Matthew 4.11, Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. So his public ministry starts with a, with a battle with the devil right off the bat. Okay? So then the devil left him. But not for long. Because it says in Luke 4.13 and 14, When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. All right? And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. You know what? You'll learn the power of the Spirit when you go through the battle and come out victorious at the end. So when Jesus comes out now, right? He's going through that, that trial. Where does he go? He goes into the church buildings. Listen to these verses. I'm going to read Luke 4, verses 15 to 28. And he, Jesus, began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him, and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you in truth, there were many wid widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elijah the prophet, 
and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. So Jesus begins his public ministry by going into the buildings, into the synagogue, to preach. And that's all lovely. You know, he's reading the word, and that's lovely. Until he applies it. Until he says, this is real. And the thing that he says next is, you want to know something? God is going out to those who are not the Jews. Not what you, because they were filled with pride. They thought that their position as the people of God made them better. Or they, no, not that they made them better, but they had that position because they were better and deserved it. God worked through Elijah, but he told them, don't go to your own people. Go out there to the non-Jews. That's what Jesus is saying. So what he's doing right off the bat is he is, I don't want to use this word, attacking the church. The people of God. He's using the Word of God and saying to the people of God, you're not living the Word of God. This is what Paul did. Paul imitated Christ in what he did. It's what Elijah did. It's what Elisha did. It's what Jeremiah did. It's what Ezekiel did. It's what Isaiah did. It's what John the Baptist did. You see, part of the problem is, and this is another relevance alert, mm -hmm. the church, the world should be able to see the church confront the church. Yes. Or not have to. You know, we don't. We shouldn't have to wait for a local, secular, worldly News. newspaper to, to deal with, with people in the church who are not living according to the Word of God. The church should have dealt with it first. Mm -hmm. This is relevant to our day and age. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, is it relevant to our day and age. When we see so much public disgrace in the church of Jesus Christ, it is supposed to be holy. Yes. You know why? Because the church isn't dealing with the problem. All right, so now, when Jesus actually confronts these people inside the synagogue, what happens then? They're filled with rage, and now it's out of the church building and into the highways and byways. Jesus was going through all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. Matthew 4, 23. Then in Luke 4, 42 and 44, it says, When they came, Jesus left and went to a secluded place, and the crowds were searching for him, and came to him and tried to keep him from going away. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. All right? So now all of a sudden he's starting to go, he's starting to go out. All right? This is followed, that story is followed in Luke 5 by the, the account of a carpenter telling the fishermen how to fish. Remember the story? Yes. Jesus tells Peter, Peter is a professional fisherman who's grown up on the sea. Jesus, the carpenter, tells him to go back out onto the sea and lower his nets and they get this incredible catch. You know why? Because Jesus is showing him it's not just about what takes place in the synagogue, it's what takes place in your workplace. Mm -hmm. That Christ came to deal with you and your life in your workplace. And he can bless you in ways that you can't imagine in your workplace. If you start to live a style of life that brings the word into that part of your life. That's now, that's followed. This is all leading up to where we're going here. That's followed by the account of the paralytic who was lowered by his friends through the roof, right? Yeah. And Jesus forgave his sins, but outside the church building. And that outraged the Pharisees. Right? It's not just that they were saying, okay, you know, who are you to forgive sins? What I think truly what really, that, that did upset him. But also, it's not taking place within the confines that religious they control, the religious trappings. the religious trappings or religious settings. Well, one of the things is that paralytic wasn't allowed on the inside of the temple. Well, you're right. Okay. Then, from there, he goes to Levi's house. Who's Levi? The Matthew. Hey, Matthew. 
Right? Levi's name was changed to Matthew. He's the one writing that gospel that we're going to study. Right? And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. And there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with him. And the Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, It is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke 5, 29 and 32. The fact is that Christ is now taking this good news. What did he say? When he picked up the, his first thing, he picks up the scriptures and reads from Isaiah. He came to set the captives free. Jesus Christ came to bring light. He came to heal the sick. The spiritually sick as well as the physically sick. All right? And this outraged the religious leaders of the time because it wasn't contained in their framework. Now, listen, we're, we're going to run short of time here tonight, but the reason I'm saying all this is because I'm going to tell you, and we're going to see that the Sermon on the Mount is the most important sermon ever preached. It doesn't take place in the temple. It doesn't take place in the synagogue. It takes place out there. We, in the church today, have confined the Word of God inside a little building that we expect people to come to rather than us going out to them. I'll give you one more relevance alert. Okay, why is this relevant? Because the church, like the God of the church, is not contained in a building. All right? Acts 17, 24. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Got that? Acts 17, 24. He will not live in a building made by the hands of man. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 16, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? God does not want people to come into the house of the Lord. How many, how many people, pastors, stood up this past Sunday? Or this coming Sunday will. And they'll say, welcome to the house of the Lord. That is a life, listen. That's a life in the pits of hell. God doesn't want to welcome people or have people come into the house of the Lord. He wants them to be the house of the Lord. And that's the message that the church today is not preaching. Now, since the reign of Emperor Constantine, we have made the church building the focus of Christianity rather than Jesus Christ who brings us to the Father. Now, you know, even in the time of Jesus, the focus was on the temple rather than the God who inspired him. That's evident even to the time so much in, later in Jesus' life when the disciples came to him and were pointing out, right? I'll, I'll read it, Matthew 24, 1. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him, like he had never seen them. Because they're amazed by the, the beauty and the glory of the building. So, what did he do? He took it outside for the single most relevant sermon ever preached. The Sermon on the Mount. The Word of God is relevant to your life. If you apply it in your life. If you don't take the Word of God and live it day by day, it will have no change in your life. And you will miss the blessings that God promised in Deuteronomy 28. And I promise you that you need those blessings. You need the Lord God to bless your spouse. Divorce is rampant, both in and out of the church, more in the church than out. You need the Lord to bless your children. Because the peer pressure on them is massive and horrible. Hear the Word of God, obey the Word of God, and be blessed by the Word of God. Make sure you're back next time as we get into the Sermon on the Mount. So, Father, we do. We just... We praise you, we give you thanks for your word, your word made flesh who dwelt among us, and your word that has the power to 
to transform us, to change us, to mold us into what you desire us to be. And Lord, what you desire us to be is ambassadors for you, bringing the knowledge of your love and your power into every place that we go, into our homes, into our workplace, into the grocery stores, into every place that we go. Father, I thank you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Until next time. God's love above the heaven. Only by grace can we stand. Not by a human endeavor, but by the blood of the Lamb. Into your presence you call us, you call us to come.